Mr. Rogers, good to have you back. Hope you're safe and you continue to uh, maintain good health and everyone in your family is fine and safe. Mr. Rogers, good morning. Good to have you back on ET now. I uh, hope everything is fine at your hand and you and your family are safe and you are taking adequate precautions because uh, you know Singapore has also become one of those places where the coronavirus has been very large. We are all fine. We wash our hands. I hope you're washing your hands. We are, we're okay. Thank you very much. So Mr. Rogers, what is happening to the world? Everybody is simply trying to use the word liquidity and when I ask experts that why are markets going on when the world is looking bad the simple answer is it's liquidity it is fed it is money you're asking me watch et now you know that's how you find out what's going on in the world you watch et now what the main thing that's going on in the world is that central banks all over the world are printing huge amounts of money and governments are borrowing and spending huge amounts of money you know, every day the Bank of Japan goes in there and starts printing money as fast as they can and buying stocks, buying ETFs, buying bonds. The same, somewhat the same is happening all over the world. In the U.S., they're not buying stocks, we don't think, yet, but they're buying everything else. This is insane. But, I mean, it's, it's great for investors. It's great for stockbrokers. It's great for ET now. Is it good for the world? No. So, Mr. Rogers... If global central bankers are likely to print more money and if interest rates are likely to remain low, then what could be the end game for equities and for this so-called summer madness which we've seen in just about every asset class? Well, first you must remember that in America there's an election in November. And in Washington, they're doing everything they can to get reelected. I mean, that's what they do. They, they, they don't care about us. They don't care about our children. They care about getting elected. So until November, anyway, uh, uh, this is all going to continue in the U.S., but other places will probably follow, too. The end game? Well, often, often in history, after a long rise in a market, it turns into a blow-off bubble, especially when there's a huge amount of money that suddenly comes in. I'm not very good at market timing, but I suspect we may have a blow off, at least in the American stock market and maybe the Japanese stock market because of all this madness that's going on. So, Mr. Rogers, to your mind, what is the importance of this year's presidential election? Well, it's, it's huge important because the, the person in charge, but it always happens, not just in America, all over the world, the person in office wants to get reelected. And so the person in office and his party will do everything they can to get reelected. And in American history, anyway, it's very difficult to replace a, a president who's in power because he has the ability, if he needs money over here, he spends a lot of money over here. The opposition cannot do that. And so usually presidents get reelected and Mr. Trump is certainly wants to get reelected and he certainly will spend as much money as he can wherever he has to to get reelected and his party to get reelected. Mr. Rogers, uh, I, God forbid, but if there is a second wave of coronavirus, how do you think markets are likely to react to that? Well, I don't. Uh, the, the, most governments will not close down a second time around. At least they will not be as draconian as they have the first time around, uh, because they realize, you know, the the cure can be worse than the disease. And in some countries, the cure has been worse than the disease. So you will not see that again. You may see areas closed down, but the basic economic damage has been done, there will be more if there are more closed downs. But no, countries now realize that they have to eat and they have to survive and closing everything down will not work. Mr. Rogers, in hindsight, when we will look at the lockdown which global leaders, in a sense, decided to do to prevent the spread of coronavirus, do you think a year from now, six months, uh, six, two years from now, five years from now, 
that will be called as the biggest mistake of modern history by global politicians who have used a hard hand to control coronavirus? Well, the biggest mistake of modern history is quite, <laughs> quite a statement. Uh, I will certainly say, I know we're going to look back and say it was a very bad mistake and it was a mistake of history, the biggest in modern history. I, certainly the biggest mistake of 2020 uh, and certainly a very, very big mistake. You know, not everybody closed. Uh, Sweden didn't close. I mean, they have problems, but they didn't close. They say that in the end, they will come out ahead because other people have will have recurrence. Eight American states never closed. Belarusia never closed. So not everybody closed. But as far as I can see, yes, it was a mistake and we should not have done it. I, I would just let me just add one thing. You know, we've had viruses so and like epidemics. Before. We've had this before throughout history. Never before did the whole world close down when we had epidemics. You know, we've had several in this century and certainly in the last century. This is the first time that the whole world has closed down the economies and it's not, it's not a good decision. Mr. Rogers, typically when market cycles they peak out, it happens because of debt. Leverage goes higher, companies find it difficult to service debt, interest rates they go higher and then things start uh, falling down like nine pins. But if I look at the world right now, well, debt could be large in government's balance sheet, but private debt and the household debt is not that high. Could that be the differentiating factor this time? I, I don't think that the household debt, maybe it's not as high as it would have been. I mean, nobody can get a loan, but people are, unfortunately, people are not having income. And so they're borrowing money somehow on their credit cards or whatever. So yeah, maybe household debt is not skyrocketed like government debt, but, you know, the U.S. was the largest debtor nation in the world three months ago. Well, since then, they have added trillions, trillions with a T of debt, both the central bank, the central government, all the states and cities. And this has happened throughout the world. Japan has added huge amounts of debt. So even if Japanese citizens or American citizens aren't adding huge amounts of debt, don't worry, the governments are. Mr. Rogers, what do you make of the current... Uh size and the scale and the market cap of the U.S. tech giants, whether it is Apple or Alphabets for Google or for that matter Netflix, uh, some of these companies are now commanding market caps which run into trillions of dollars. Their market caps are bigger than a lot of countries put together. Well, as I said before, you, you know, these things often end in blow-offs and that part of the market is already beginning to have its own blow-off. Uh, they go up every, nearly every day. Uh, the, the valuation is incomprehensible to those of us who are, you know, a little more conservative. So, yes, no, th this is part of the same thing I was talking about. You this often winds up in a in a mania, a, a, a bubble. And that looks to be what's forming in the U.S. and maybe in some other places as well. I mean, some Chinese stocks are the same way. I mean, Alibaba, Tencent, some of these stocks just never go down. So what should an investor do in this kind of an environment, Mr. Rogers? Because clearly investing in debt would be a stupid idea because interest rates are going to remain low. Uh, buying equities could be dangerous because equity prices have already run up. What should one do? Well, people should, I'll tell you what I always tell you, only invest in what you yourself know a lot about. Don't listen to me or anybody else. Maybe E.T. Maybe you can listen to E.T. now. But only stay with what you know. Now, as I look around the world, I'll tell you what I'm doing. Uh, bonds are clearly a bubble. Bonds have never in world history been this expensive. Never, ever. Uh, Stocks, we just talked about some stocks are clearly, for me anyway, much, much too high. Uh, as I look, is, uh, commodities are the cheapest asset class there is right now, but we could have said that a few, a few weeks ago too. But as I look around the world, commodities and some of the beaten down areas like airlines, transportation, hotels, some of these are very cheap as well on any kind of historic basis. So these are the places I like to find things that are that are ignored and cheap. Uh, but some people are very good at buying Amazon and Baidu and buying these stocks that go up all the time. I am not any good at that. Uh, when I spoke to you last, Mr. Rogers, you picked up a silver glass you took out a gold coin from your pocket and you held it for our viewers and you said, look, I'm drinking from silver and I'm keeping gold in my pocket. 
have you added more gold in your pocket and have you bought more silverware after that i have bought a little more gold i'm not buying a lot right now because in much of and certainly in asia many people are having to sell their gold and silver to uh to eat you know these are hard times in some places so i am waiting i would suspect maybe later this summer uh, i'll buy more gold and silver because before this is over gold and silver are certainly going to turn into a bubble you know when people get terrified of the governments and of paper money they always go to gold and silver they always have anyway and they will again so i'm i'm like all the other peasants in the world all of us peasants know we better have some gold you're the only one who came on et now on the morning when crude fell to zero and you said oil cannot remain at zero forever guess what from zero it has become 40 dollars again what is the real level for oil where are, why do you think the fundamentals for oil are moving is i make a lot of mistakes and lots of mistakes you want to hear about my first wife oh what a terrible mistake that was so i make plenty of mistakes uh oil is in the process of making a complicated bottom a a serious bottom uh the known reserves of oil continue to decline fracking fracking is no that fracking bubble has popped you know it used to be if you could spell fracking people would give you money but now we know you have to make money and fracking is going to continue but it's going to have to be much there be much less oil from fracking and it will have to be at much higher prices so oil is making a bottom a complicated bottom i mean you know you watch et now it takes a while for a stock or a commodity or anything a market to make a real bottom and we're having that's what's happening with oil right now china mr rogers for last 20 years has been one of the demand and consumption drivers for the world chinese became rich chinese economy boom chinese started traveling a bit more and their appetite to consume was insatiable how do you see that changing now that there seems to be a challenge challenge at least on the global trade stroke, stroke uh, you know trade front china like everybody else i mean china's China has not escaped and will not escape what's going on. Uh you know that as well as I do. They know that as well as I do. Um they will they are opening up. They've certainly opened up more than most other countries so far and they seem to have done a less bad job. You know, I I don't know if we can trust any government when what they say about the virus. It, if you listen to them, they have done a less bad job. They are opening up. I can certainly see every day on the internet many chinese cities and restaurants and places are open so they are opening they're coming back but they're coming back slowly but remember if you are an airport and you have no flights and then next week you have six flights it looks better it looks better than it was before and so everybody's going to look better for a while just because we're opening up many parts of the world economy and things will look better than they were when everything was closed Will it be better a year from now? I suspect not, but watch ET now. They'll tell you. Okay. Well, for those who are watching ET now and right now want to understand from what Jim Rogers is planning to do, let's focus on that. Now, you have been one of those uh, you know, a road trip and a biker who likes to go on long bike rides and long road rides. So, Jim Rogers has to go on a long ride, a boat ride or a road trip. in 2020 where he's not going to check on the prices for next 5 years but he's allowed to invest in three assets or commodities or three investments next 5 years what would you do silver gold agriculture okay silver gold i understand agriculture very interesting let's walk through it what are your thoughts there agriculture has been a disaster for 30 or 40 years the average age of farmers in america is 58 in japan it's 66 more people commit suicide in the uk in agriculture than any other sector more kids study public relations in america than study agriculture agriculture has been a nightmare it's turning it's got to turn or we're not going to have any food or we're not going to have any clothes fair point but some would also argue mr rogers that the modern science has developed 
and because of fertilizer, better pesticide, better medicines, the agriculture produce globally has increased. So the pricing uh, power for some of the agri crops may not be there. Absolutely, yes. I mean, India is a good example of that, but not just India. Every not not just, not everywhere, but nearly everywhere. No, technology is always making advances in any sector of the economy, and including agriculture. But still, somebody's got to make the food. Somebody's got to tell the computer what to do. Uh, it, maybe not. Maybe we're going to have depression in agriculture for another thirty years. I suspect not. I bought some agriculture recently. Not, not that that means it's right. I told you my market timing is always bad. I bought some agriculture. I bought some Chinese wine stocks recently, sh Russian shipping companies, Japanese uh, ETFs. I have been buying a few things that are depressed. But if you ask me for the next five years, I told you, gold, silver and agriculture. Mr. Rogers, do you think in the next couple of years, dollar could lose its charm of being the reverse currency because one day world will realize that US debt is getting unmanageably high. Even though right now money has moved into dollar because of chaos in the world, do you think it's a matter of time a bright boy will get up from the right side of the bed and say, hey, America has got debt issues and dollars should not strengthen? Very good insight. I happen to own a lot of US dollars, despite what you just said, and despite that America is the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. I own them because as turmoil develops, people look for a safe haven. They think the dollar is a safe haven for historic reasons. It's not, it's not, but everybody thinks it is, so I own the US dollar. It's going to get overpriced. It might even turn into a bubble. I hope when that happens, I'm smart enough to sell my US dollars because every word you said is right. And it's worse than what you said. The debt gets higher and higher and higher every week. No, the US dollar is probably in its last, I mean, last legs. It could go on for a while. It has gone on for a while. But many countries, China, India, Russia, many countries are looking for ways to compete with the US dollar. They're looking for something to compete with the IMF and the World Bank and, and the currency uh, settlements. So the world is already trying to figure out a way to do something and compete with the US dollar. So you're exactly right. I'm not the only person. I'm not the only person who knows the US dollar has serious, serious problems. Do you envisage a world that transactions could move to digital currency like Bitcoin and other currencies in the next couple of years? Uh, it's going to move on the computer. In some countries, it's already on the computer. Uh, you know, in China, you can't get a taxi with money. You have to have your computer money if you want to get a taxi or buy an ice cream or something. So that's already happening. Yes, money will be on the computer, but it's going to be government money. You know, governments don't want to lose control. And I, I don't like this, by the way, but, but governments will, all money will be on the computer, but it will be government money. It already is in some countries, China, I mentioned, and that's going to continue. Governments love this. It gives them more control, more power. Someday they're going to be able to call you up and say, you know, you've had too much tea this month. Stop drinking so much tea. They're going to know everything you do. They love it. I don't. So, Mr. Rogers, I'm going to quote you again. And you always said that markets never ever react to the same thing twice. This crisis, what do you think ha will teach governments and others uh, in administration and powers to be about the world and about their economic policies? The reason I'm asking you this, Mr. Rogers, is because 2008 crisis happened because of lack of liquidity and the Fed was aware of that. So when this crisis happened, central banks, before the crisis occurred, they started printing a lot of liquidity. So there is no liquidity problem. But each crisis always teaches, uh, you know, all of us something. What do you think this crisis will teach the administration and the powers to be? You think bureaucrats learn anything? <laughs> come on, come on. Uh, nowhere in the world. Uh, yes, what they learned from the last time was they, we, we need to flood the world with money. So they're flooding the world with money. That's going to lead to another problem, I assure you. You know, when we wake up in five years or 10 years, whenever we look back from this before, we're going to realize that the staggering amounts of money that was printed, the staggering amounts of debt that were added have only made things worse. 
I mean, it's a good thing I'm old. My children are going to have a horrible time in their lifetimes because the United States has added huge amounts of debt, uh, as have many other countries, not just the United States. I mean, England, you look around, Japan, everybody. So the world's going to have, you know, many times in the world we've had slow periods where, where the world didn't have vibrant, dynamic economies. I would suspect we're going to enter a period like that because of all this huge amounts of debt and money printing. You know, last time when you came on air, the interview was very well received, but I also got a lot of feedback from our viewers. And uh, some feedbacks were, uh, will you please ask Mr. Rogers about his favorite books? Will you please ask Mr. Rogers about the inside which he tracks on a daily basis? And will you please ask Mr. Rogers the secret behind looking so young? <laughs> E.T. now! All you need to, all your viewers need to know is E.T. now. No, I, I, I'm partly serious. You know, the first time I went to India, I discovered the Economic Times. I could not believe what a great newspaper that was. And I have been a fan of E.T. ever since in all of your formats. Uh, but I do read, I go on, now I don't have to get paper newspapers, but I read the Financial Times of, from London uh, every day. I do go on the internet to see what's happening in the world. If I get interested in something, it, it used to be I had to get the annual reports by mail, et cetera. Now I can do everything on the internet. And so that's mainly what I what I do to, to keep informed as far as, well, I don't know if I look young or not, you know, but I do go to the gym. In fact, I was in the gym when I suddenly realized I had to come talk to you. I spend two or three hours a day in the gym if I can. But Mr. Rogers, unlike a lot of investors who have a team, who have a research head, who have some junior researchers working for them, you're a one-man army. You manage all your research, you still don't use a computer, you still use a calculator and Excel sheets uh, written by hand. Uh, why is that? I mean, even I have kept up with the times. <laughs> even I can use a computer now. My 12-year-old my daughter has to show me some things. When I have a problem with the phone, I get my 12-year-old daughter to come and explain explain how to how to do it. But no, I'm I'm keeping up a little bit with the times, uh, and you know, the, the internet, as you know, is a miracle for all of us, and it makes life a lot simpler. The the thing that we all have to remember is just because you get a lot more information and get it a lot faster, it's still judgment. It is still judgment that is required to be successful at anything, whether it's TV, anything, music, you have to have good judgment, and I certainly make plenty of mistakes. Well, judgment, I think that is the most important takeaway for our viewers, that you may have a lot more information, but how do you judge and react to the information is important. I appreciate your time, Mr. Rogers. Thank you for joining us. Stay safe, and certainly hope to see much more of you going forward. I look forward to ET now. Keep up the good work. Thank you.